to make my standard disclaimer. Although I make dictionaries, I suffer from some handicaps. One of them is being a Gen Xer, one of them is being female, and one of them is being from the South. So if you hear me pronounce a word in a certain way, look it up first before you say, oh, that's how you pronounce it, because my pronunciation is actually terrible. This is the title of my talk. All your texts are belong to us. <laughs> now, this is a bold statement. This is a fairly geeky statement. And what you might be asking about this statement is, who's us, right? Well, us lexicographers. This is the definition of lexicographer for the new Oxford American Dictionary. And in fact, lexicographer, although it's a fairly rare word, lexicographers are fairly rare birds, um, it's a word that you're going to find in almost every dictionary, no matter how small. You could have a vest pocket English Bulgarian dictionary. <laughs> And I bet you'd find the word lexicographer in it, because when people find out you're a lexicographer, they say, what's that? And although we never, ever say this, we want to be able to say, go look it up. <laughs> so I'm a lexicographer. People, when people find out I'm a lexicographer, sometimes they back away. They back away like they feel some kind of inner guilt. They think that I'm going to criticize them. They, they feel like I'm, I'm going to be a cross between this <laughs> You know, stereotypical librarian. Librarians actually never look like this. Librarians are, in fact, really, really cool. My favorite people are librarians. But they think I'm a cross between their stereotype of a librarian and this. They, they think that I'm going to, to say, you know, that I'm going to say shh. They're going to say, that I'm going to say, uh, you said nauseous and you really meant nauseated. And. <laughs> And then I'm going to follow it up by saying, go wash your hands. <laughs> but I don't do this. Lexicographers don't do this. Why do people think that I'm going to be so critical? It's because they have a couple very wrong ideas about dictionaries. The first wrong idea that people have about dictionaries is that dictionaries are this, right? Dictionary is a beauty contest for words. No, it's not. I'm not the judge of the word beauty contest. I am not the judge of the Westminster Word Show. I am not. I, I'm not the bouncer behind the velvet rope at the Word nightclub. Uh, I don't, I'm not in charge of the Fortune Word 500. I, I, I don't keep the social register of words. Words don't go in the dictionary because I love them, because they're beautiful, and I don't keep them out if I think they're ugly. They're in the dictionary because the dictionary is full of words that are useful. The dictionary is full of words that people use. If people use ugly words, they're going to go in the dictionary. And if nobody uses a really beautiful word, um, like my favorite word, erinaceous, which means of, like, or pertaining to hedgehogs, <laughs> if people don't use it, it's not going to be in the dictionary. So please use erinaceous. The <laughs> That's a real word, by the way. All words are real, but that word is in one dictionary. It's in the Oxford English Dictionary, the big one. Um, so uh, the other wrong idea that people have about dictionaries is they think dictionaries are like this. They're like the Ten Commandments. They were written in stone. The language never changes. The dictionary never changes. Um, it came down from a high place where something was on fire. And <laughs> they feel like, I got a dictionary in 1962 when I graduated from high school. I don't need a new one because the language never changes. And this is not true. The language changes all the time. Yesterday, just in, the, just in one session alone, I took three pages of notes on new words. Granted, it was the session with uh, Bruce Sterling and Blaine Brunel. <laughs> but the language changes. So uh, these are the two wrong ideas that, that people have about dictionaries. They think it's a beauty contest. They think it's an unchanging record of the English language. But it's not. The dictionary is a tool. Um, it's not the Bible. It's not a beauty contest. It's a tool, a tool that helps you write, a tool that helps you read, a tool that helps you understand. Um, it's, it's a tool. In fact, I once gave somebody a copy of the shorter Oxford English Dictionary. And of course, let me tell you that the shorter Oxford English Dictionary is in two volumes, and it weighs about 14 pounds. He, he won it in a contest, and we asked him, what are you going to do with this dictionary? How are you going to use this tool? And he said, I'm going to take it to bars and use it to pick up girls. <laughs> And I didn't question him. It would have worked on me. So, so sometimes the tool can be really simple. And sometimes we suffer from feature creep. Um, I, I managed to put the kibosh on the scratch and sniff dictionary. 
But most of the time, it's like this. It it, you can do a lot of different things at once with a dictionary. You can find out how things are pronounced, which you can't do by listening to me. You can, um, you can find out how things are spelled. You can find out their meanings. You can find out their histories. Lots of people use their dictionaries as doorstops or to press flowers. There are lots of things you can do with this tool. And in fact, I was thinking yesterday when we heard about the drill, how the drill's only used for, for like 20 minutes in its whole lifetime. Sometimes they feel that way about dictionaries, but I realized that, that people don't feel bad about not using their drill more often. They don't go up to people who make drills and say, I'm really sorry, I, I don't use my drill as often as I ought to. People do come up to me and say that about dictionaries, and I forgive you. Go forth, sin no more, use it more. Um, so. But it's a special kind of tool. The dictionary is an information tool. It takes messy information, messy information about language, and it gives it a fairly clean interface. It, it's an information tool. Now, we use information tools all the time. This is where we are right now. A map is an information tool. Um, stock charts are an information tool. Uh, let's see what other, and there are lots of information tools. Census, demographic information is really messy. You can't really grasp what the United States is like, but a census helps you get an idea of it. Well, all these information tools are made out of data, right? Data. But when you talk about data, that seems pretty sterile. We don't really care about data that doesn't relate to us in some way. That, um, you know, there's the, the proverb that man is the measure of all things. We only care about data when it's related to people. So uh, maps, maps are about people. Stock charts are about how money relates to people. Um, dictionaries are about people. And, and by the way, Soylent Green, people. Um, <laughs> so, but I can't go around and interview everybody in the whole world and talk about, well, how do you use language? So we have to use a proxy for this data. The proxy we use for data is, is text, right? What people write. We'd like to do what people speak, but you can't go and surreptitiously record people. And the NSA hasn't given me access to Echelon yet. So we really are limited to written data. Now, I haven't really asked them, but every time I'm on the phone, I'm on the phone, I mention how cool it would be if I had access to the Echelon data. Um, so, I mean, they should know by now. That's what I want. So we have, we have text, right? And we get it into a format that we, get it into a format we can use. And, and, and we put it through what I like to call the Dictionaryizer 3000. And, and we, we distill this text. We look, we analyze this text, what people write, and we make it into a dictionary. Now, I like to say that um, uh, dictionaries are the vodka of literature. We take the wheat and the rye and the potatoes, we take really meaty things, and we make it into something that's odorless, colorless, tasteless, but really powerful. <laughs> so, and it goes great with Red Bull. And, <laughs> There's no dictionary citrone yet, though. I'm really sorry. So that's what we do. So we've done this already. Oxford has done this to over, we've analyzed over a billion words of text. A billion words. That's a lot. It's more than, it's more than the number of people in squatter cities, we found out. So if each of them only had one word, we'd still be ahead at this point. But it's, it's not enough. It's not enough. We haven't really analyzed everything that we can analyze. It's all just cut the surface right now. So. Basically, if you want to make a map, right, you don't own the data about where your house is. Unless you're Area 51, you're going to be on the map. So if, you're making, if you want to do a census, the government compels you to fill out your census form. The SEC says you have to release this financial data that anybody can publish. But text, copyright. You know, so people are fencing in works that they've made out of the commons, out of the English language. And you know, it doesn't diminish the English language. If you use a word, I can still use the word. Somebody else can still use the word. It doesn't make the English language less, but it doesn't enrich it either. And people who believe the language is unchanging may not feel like they have to give back, that they may not have to let us analyze what they've done with the language, how they've used it. But, but it's really important. I like to think of the English language as a, a giant kinetic sculpture, a mobile. All those little dangly bits, picture hundreds of thousands of them, and each one is a word. And every time a writer or a speaker touches one of those dangly bits, touches a word, uses a word, the whole thing moves. The whole language moves. 
And sometimes it might shiver, and sometimes it might careen wildly around, but it always moves. And then the lexicographer has to run back up and take another picture. We have to do another map. We have to take another census of the English language. Every time you touch a word, I'm exaggerating slightly for effect. <laughs> but really, if you use the language, you change the language. You can't, uh, you can't not use it, and uh, you can't not change it when you use it. Now I can see some. I can see a lot of you in the audience. I can see you preparing your question for the question period. I know what your question is going to be. Your question is going to be, what about fair use, right? Fair use. Now. We, uh, we should really be covered by fair use. Scholarly, you don't get much more scholarly than Oxford University Press, I gotta tell you. So, um, and that me analyzing a copyrighted work doesn't interfere with the sale of that copyrighted work. It doesn't replace its value. Um, being a bad knockoff of the Da Vinci Code might impede its value, but me analyzing it for lexicographical purposes doesn't make it sell any fewer copies. But, um, when we're looking at this text, we really want the whole thing. Now, in, in the olden days of lexicography, uh, and in many dictionaries right now, they just use little bits of text. Somebody read one sentence and thought, this would be useful for dictionary editors, and they just took that little bit. But they cherry-picked all the best bits. So Samuel Johnson, this is what he did, but in just 16 years after Samuel Johnson died, long after he had stopped working on the dictionary, do you know how many novels were published, were printed in London? In 1800, 250 novels were published in London. 250. And that wasn't all new, new production. Those were reprints, too. So even Samuel Johnson would have only had to read about 250 books in a year to cover most of what was being written and what he could acquire in, in English at that time. Do you know how many billion dollars um, the book industry made in 2005? 25 billion. So think about how many books you have to sell to make 25 billion dollars when a lot of them are at Walmart for 12.99. So we couldn't just read everything ourselves. It all has to be processed. It all has to be dealt with electronically. And well, but, you know, we want to we want to have access to all the data. This is an artist rendering of what it looks like. Um, and explicitly, explicitly they say, don't do that. No photostat, no microfilm, no xerography, or making a Xerox, which is what Xerox hates you to say, um, cannot be incorporated into any information retrieval system, electronic or mechanical. Mechanical. I couldn't even make a lexicographical abacus if I wanted, <laughs> without the written permission of the copyright owner, right? And so you're thinking, well, okay, well, people need to protect, people feel they need to protect their um, intellectual property. I'm not interested in intellectual property. I don't care about your plot. I don't care about your ideas. I just want to know how you're using the language. I want to analyze it. I'm almost reverse engineering your process of writing, but not to make another book. Not to make another book that's just like your book. I just want to know the process. And um, it, it's almost as if I decided to scan your automobile and figure out what it's made of just understand how automobiles interact with people and not to make another Chrysler. And not to figure out that the seats are made of fine Corinthian leather. You know, I don't need to know that. I just want to know, what's it made of? How does it work? So, um, so if I, uh, you, in fact, I will show you what it looks like after we put it through the Dictionary Dictionaryizer 3000. Can you find a plot here? Can you, can you find an idea even? It's very difficult. The only idea that comes through from this is Lexical. We can say, in what context is the word copyright used? And from that we can derive, we can induce what it means. Now, you can say, okay, well, if you're, the reason that we, uh, the, the reason that I'm going to not answer the fair use question is because even though it makes perfect sense that this kind of use is fair use, this is America. Anybody can sue anybody for anything. And it is so prohibitive to defend a case about fair use that unless it is explicitly granted to us, people tell us not to do it. Don't do it. It's not worth it. One of these cases would be impossible. It would be really expensive for poor dictionaries to defend against. So we don't want to pay. <laughs> you know that $25 billion that I told you the book industry made last year? The dictionary part of that? Rounding error. 
We don't actually have the money to pay. And in fact, it would be extortion. What we would be doing is paying so that people wouldn't sue us for a right that we feel is implicit. But what we would like to have happen is that, have that implicit right be made explicit. This is a, the you know, copyright text, but I've, I've made an addition that I've helpfully circled in red. Lots of copyright texts say, OK, fair use makes um, implicit that you can excerpt parts to write articles, reviews about this work. Um, we don't care whether it's uh, favorable or unfavorable. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Go ahead. So they've made explicit right here that you can do that. Why don't we make explicit that you can use it for language research purposes? We've already established it doesn't interfere with the value of the original copyright work or the ideas, but it helps everybody by making better dictionaries. Now, I'd like people to put this back door into their copyright statements. Believe me, almost nobody looks at these, except for people like me. So if you're writing a book and your proofs come, just make this change on the copyright page. <laughs> they'll, they'll probably let it go right through. And then I can analyze your writing, and you will affect not you already affect how the English language works. Now you will affect the reporting. It will become codified. Your change will be reflected in the dictionary. Now, there are lots of ways which we could say, you know, we could ask for this to happen. Um, since I'm from the South, I think asking nicely is a good idea. You get more text with honey than you get with vinegar. Um, or we, so we could thank people. We could beg really nicely for people's text, which is kind of what I'm doing here. Um, or we could pillory. I could make a list of all the people who said no and publicize it and say, well, these are people who are not sharing the comments of the English language. Um, or we could share. You make your text available to lexicographers. And I've been lobbying very hard. Why don't we make more dictionary APIs? I don't say, think that I have, that the print dictionary or any of our electronic versions are the best way to represent dictionary data. There are people. There are lots of people. There are, in fact, large percentiles of people who are smarter than I am and might have better ideas about how to do dictionary text. If we had an API, they could go and mess around with it. Why not? Let's see what dictionary mashups you do. What kind of cool ideas could you make with dictionary data? What could you connect it to that would enrich both parts? So I think that it would be better if we shared. And in fact, if you have an idea for sharing, uh, email this address, or you can reach me through my address a day blog, or basically any other email address I have, and just tell me what your idea is, and I'll see what we can do. Well, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much.